Okay, so I think we can start. It's five past. So it's it's our pleasure to um, to have Anna Anna Sørensen from Copenhagen uh, speaking today, and I'll just say a few words about his trajectory and where um, and where he uh, studied. And so he he did his undergrad um, and in at Aarhus in in Denmark at Aarhus University, where he studied physics and chemistry. And then he continued there um, to do his PhD with uh, Klaus Mölmer. And actually, during this time, he um, helped develop or developed the Sørensen Mölmer gate, which I think many of us have heard about um, for, for traps uh, or for, for gates on trapped ions. Um, and he stayed for a year or so uh, at Aarhus University to do a brief postdoc and then actually came to, to ITAM. So he is he is a local, or I mean, he knows he knows ITAM and has been there very fruitfully. And then after this period in the US, he went back to Copenhagen, or like now to Copenhagen um, in 2004, where he uh, started his own group at the Niels Bohr Institute and the University of Co at the University of Copenhagen, where he now is a full professor. Um, and his like he has received um, prizes for his work, for example, like the silver medal from the Danish Royal Academy in 2007 and in 2011, the Jens Martin Knudsen Prize for Excellence in Teaching. So it's um, exciting to have a, a, um, an excellent teacher tonight. tonight. And um, Anas will talk about photon-photon interactions in waveguides and the physics of photon bound states. Screen is yours. Okay, that works great. All right. Let me just do. I want to do one more thing. Let me. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. There now you can also see my pointer. Yes. Right. So thanks a lot for the introduction and also thank you for the invitation. As was just said, I was an ITAM postdoctoral fellow. I had a great time. So at this point, I would normally say that I am so glad to be back and I always enjoy to be back. Uh, well, at least I'm virtually back. So it's still a pleasure to see everybody. So what I want to talk about, uh, as it was said, some work we've been doing for the past three or four years about how to play around with the interactions of photons and wave guys. All right, so, and now, oh, there we go. So, but before I get into it, I would like to actually thank, in particular, my main collaborator. This was something that I started doing with Sahan Mahmoudian uh, some several years ago when he was in Copenhagen. He was actually not working with me, he was working with my colleague, Peter Lohel, but then I noticed there was a great guy in another group, so let's steal him. That's easier than getting your own money. Uh, so Clemens actually moved on to join, uh, sorry, Sahan moved on to join Clemens in Hanover. And Clemens was very nice because he heard what Sahan was doing and said, oh, that's great. So instead of assigning Sahan to do Clemens' own project, Clemens decided, let's join in, let's join forces, this is fun. And later on, we also teamed up with the team of Derek Chang to do some numerical simulations that we couldn't do. And also there'll be some experimental work in the group of Arno Rauschenbeutel. But I, in particular, I should thank the people from my own group, Sumanda, Yu Chang, Bastian, Johannes. They are all people who have worked in various aspects uh, in my group on this stuff. And I'll show some of their results today. All right. But what do we mean by, why do we want to do photon-photon interactions? Well, if you think about quantum information, which is what I do most of my time, most of my career, I've been working on uh, quantum information. If you can begin to make photon-photon interactions, there will be many, many possibilities because we want to encode information in a single photon. If we want to process that, we need to be able to do gates and so on. So we would like to understand a single photon. Now, this is what I do most of my career, but actually, the talk I'm talking, the stuff I'm talking about today was actually motivated by me wanting to take a break for this. So this was, I just wanted to do some interesting physics. So, you know, what I'm be talking about has these applications, but for what I'll be saying today, I'll just be talking about it because I think it's interesting physics. Well, so why do I think it's interesting? Well, one motivation comes from this. I think we have all seen Star Wars and I think we were all fascinated by the first time we saw a lightsaber duel between 
Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. So why was this so fascinating? Well, there were several things, but one of them is that actually one of the weird things going on is you have some pretty strong photon-photon interactions going on. I mean, this was like, whoa, what's going on? Light normally don't interact. They just, photons just go through each other. So this phenomena here of having photon-photon interaction is actually rather strange. So this sort of fascinates me. So deep down, what I want to do today is try to explain the physics of Star Wars, of course. All right. And I should be a little bit careful with that because when I say Star Wars, physicists are often divided. They are Star Wars fans, they're Star Trek fans. So if you're a Star Trek fan, I'll try to squeeze in a Star Trek reference later on in the talk. Anyway, in terms of explaining the physics of Star Wars, I should also admit that there's also another weird optical effect going on here. Uh, yeah, so the main thing is the protons normally don't interact. So it's fun to see what they do when they do. But I should admit that there's also a weird optical effect going on here that these photons presumably don't travel further. I have no explanation for this. So this is not in my talk. I'll be talking about the photon-photon interactions. All right, and I'll be talking about it mainly for fun, but actually we did it for fun and then we looked at what we found and then it turns out, of course, some of the things I'll be talking about do have some interesting applications actually. All right, so the photon-photon interaction I'll be talking about can be represented by this Feynman diagram. It's like, okay, you have a photon, you create a particle hole pair and you scatter another photon and you have two photons going out. Okay, so this is like a scattering process that exists uh, in nature. So what we want to do is want to play around with this and see the photons collide. All right. And we want to do it in an extreme case, right? So we want to do it in a case where this is not a strong beam, this is not a strong beam, but this is one photon and this is one photon. So we really want to see at the most microscopic level, two individual photons colliding. Um, if we try to do this in vacuum, the probability of this process here would, of course, be completely negligible, right? Because the you know this cross section exists, and people have been looking for this process, but the cross section is just way, way, way too small. Okay, it doesn't occur in, in vacuum very well. But what we can do is we can actually design media where this interaction is strong. Right, and so people have played a lot with this. Uh, the main trick is that we want to couple light to atoms. Uh, so first you try with an individual atom in free space and what will most likely happen is the photon will just pass through it. So if you want to make this strong, what you do is you put it in a cavity. Now you can push in, in a single photon. This photon will bounce around a few times and will eventually be absorbed in the atom. Now, if you send in a second photon, what will happen is that this photon will probably be reflected because now the fact that this photon was absorbed shifted the resonance of the cavity. And this means that now the photon is no longer on resonance with the cavity. Okay, so this here is one example of how one can use atom to actually make a sizable interaction between single photons. All right, and people have played around with this for a long time. And the first paper I remember was like from 95 where people for the first time could see like two individual photons interacting in a cavity. And since then, of course, a lot of great work has been done to make this process really efficient. And in particular, for instance, the group of Michel Lukin, but also of uh, Gerd Rempe, they are now routinely, you know, using these processes where you actually uh, have interaction between individual photons. Now, the physics which is going in here, now there's only a single, a single atom. Uh, this means that it's actually fairly simple to understand. There can still be subtleties which are hard, but generally now what you need to solve to describe this is uh, single atom physics. Uh, so it's not very hard and you know not very challenging, interesting physical system, but it's very good for applications and it's not too complicated because then it's actually easier to design applications. So great work, nothing bad to say about it, but I'll be talking about something slightly different. Of course, there's another way that people have in recent years used a lot to make uh, photons interact, and that is putting them into Rydberg state. So the idea is I send in one photon into this ensemble. This excites um, an atom to a Rydberg level, meaning that it is rather big, 
what I mean by this is that this atom, it was excited, now affect all of the nearby atoms. There's this effect called Rydberg blockade, where one completely blocks a lot of nearby atoms. This means that if I send in a second photon, this will now see a different response because of this Rydberg excitation, and you have effective photon-photon interactions between them. And indeed, people have, over the past years, done a lot of beautiful and interesting experiments where they see effects of this and they can see dynamics of photon-photon interaction. Uh, and of course, most of the theory work is being on this has been done by various people and most of them, uh, actually a large fraction of them, I don't know most of them, but a large fraction are in some way or another affiliated with ITAM. So this is very, very local to ITAM. All right. And this system here has a more rich physics, right? So now it's more many body dynamics. There are many atoms. So now you need to be really careful to understand what goes on. It's more rich. There's complicated effect. Uh, so if you want to do applications, I don't know if these complications are good, but it makes it a more interesting physical system. There's more dynamics going on that we need to understand to understand these experiments. All right. Now, I will actually, in some sense, theoretically take a step back because to understand this system, you actually need to do a lot of things. Uh, you need to invoke three levels and have the Rydberg interaction and so on. But theoretically, there's actually a sort of a simpler problem that I think hasn't been solved in as much detail. And that is what happens if you just take a two level system and let that interact with this waveguide? Okay. That now <laughs> is again, there's a nonlinearity uh, because you can only excite this atom once. So if I send in a photon and excite it, it will just emit and move on in this uh, waveguide. And what will happen is that this photon here will get delayed because it was absorbed by the atom. All right, but let's see what happens if I now send in two photons. All right, so now if I send in my, my atom can only be excited once, of course, if I send in one fo two photons. So if I look at this, what will happen is one photon will go in, excite the atom, the second photon will come along and will stimulate the emission of the first photon. Okay, so this here gives, means that the photon will come out faster if there are two. So effectively, this means that these two photons are interacting, right? So it's not, they don't behave as, as if there was sort of, uh, if they were all alone, there is some effective interaction between. Okay, so this is the effect that I'll be studying uh, in this talk here. So what can we get out of this? What's the physics of this system once we begin to play around with photon-photon interactions in this? And as I said, it is in some sense simpler than the Rydberg, um, but yeah. Uh, people have the Rydberg is more experimentally relevant, so therefore people have worked more on this. But now, actually, people, I'll be talking to see what can we get out of this system. All right. I will need to introduce a, another type of effect here to sort of explain what is going on, and that is I will not only be dealing with waveguide interaction, I'll be dealing with a particular type of waveguide interaction, which we call chiral. Okay, to, to illustrate that, I sort of made this picture here of this is a waveguide done by my colleague Peter Lode. Okay, so what he does, he takes a piece of gallium arsenide and then he drills holes in it. These holes make a photonic band gap and then he leaves out a row of holes. So this row of holes here means that this one here effectively acts as a waveguide. Okay, so now let's try to understand what happens when we send light through it. Well, one path that light can take, sort of one stable path, is if we consider like a light beam bouncing back and forth between these holes. Okay. So now let's look at what happens to the electric field. So let's say that we have an electric field in this one here, and this has a wavelength which is like uh, twice the distance. So this is a wavelength. So this means that if I now draw the electric field, this will be up, this will be down, up, down, up, up uh, right in one direction and, the other, and so on. Okay, so in a little while, I'll sort of try to see what happens as this light field moves, right? It will just be moving along this path here. So the interesting thing is what will be the polarization that we see at this thing, at this point here. 
Okay, so now you see that actually, if you look at the direction at this point here, it actually flips around and it flips around like in a circle, right? So if I look at that point, right? So first it was up, then it was up in that direction, down, down. And if you look at that electric field, what happens is that if you are sitting at that point, you effectively have circular polarization if the photon is moving to the right. Okay, what does this mean? Well, suppose that I now throw in an atom with a level structure like that. So this transition here is talking to right circular polarization. So if it is sitting here, right, it likes to talk to this one here because that has a circular polarization. If the photon went in the other way, it would have the other polarization. So it doesn't like to talk to this transition, but talks to that transition. Okay, so this we call chiral interaction. Because what this means is that if I put an emitter here, place it in this plus state, it will not decay in both directions, but it will only decay to the right. So this here is simulation by my colleagues where they look at what happens if I place an atom here, and what is the electric field or the intensity of the light, and what they see is that it only moves to the right. And they have seen this experimentally that they really can make these chiral interactions. Okay. So what I'll be dealing with for most of this talk is I'll be looking at an atom which is coupled to this waveguide and I'll be assuming that it, for most of the talk that it only decays in one direction. That makes things a little bit easier. All right. So sort of what is the figure of merit in sort of describing how well this works? Well, this emitter here that we'll be looking at, it can decay to the right, it can decay to the left, or it can decay to the side. And of course, if we want to see nice and good effects, what we are interested in is having these coupling to the waveguide be the dominant one, because if it decays to the side, probably not very interesting things are happening. All right. So the figure of merit is basically what we call the beta factors, which is basically just beta right. That's the probability that if this one emits a photon, that the photon actually moves to the right. Or beta left, which is the probability that it moves to the left or sometimes a beta factor, which is just the sum of the two, meaning what are the good decays and if we relative to the bad decays. All right. So ideally for what I'll be talking about, beta right should be one if I want chiral interaction or beta uh, should be one if I want non-chiral interaction. All right. So if I actually do this now, I've drawn it with an atom. I have a background with atoms. Of course, there was an item that's also atoms, uh, at least in the name. Uh, so if you actually take an atom and place it like this, then most likely most of the radiation will actually go to the side. So doing it with atom is actually not a good idea if you want to have a high beta. But what has happened in recent years is that People have actually been able to make experiments where they actually reach beta on the other one. So what this means is that now it begins to be within reach of doing experiments with the system here where we can really see some non-trivial effects. All right, so I told you that people have done a lot of Rydberg things because, okay, they worked. So what I'm thinking is that soon, uh, these experiments here will also be in this regime where you can begin to see non-trivial effects. So this is why I've taken a step back and solved this in some sense simpler theoretical problem with only having two level system and seeing which kind of nonlinear interaction can we have in this case. All right. So one type of example we have is that optical frequencies is quantum dots and waveguides. So this is uh, drawing from the lab of my colleague, as I said, they had these waveguides that they made by drilling holes in a gallium arsenide and they put quantum dots in there. And what they have been able to achieve some years ago is that now if they put a quantum dot in there, it actually decays into uh, the waveguide with a reported efficiency of 98%. So this means that they are actually in the regime where you can begin to do these kind of nonlinear processes. Another system is in the microwave regime where people have been doing a lot of great stuff with superconducting qubits. So here's just a picture from the Valraff group. So they put, of course, this, uh, this is a waveguide for microwave photon. And now they put a superconducting qubit next to it. And then what happens is that the oscillation, charge oscillations here talk very strongly to this waveguide. 
And so now they can do all the same things but with microwave photons. And the really nice part about this uh, is that they are essentially perfect. Not quite no system are perfect, but when you look at the numbers they have, I mean, this interaction here just really works. It's amazing the experiment that they're trying to do with it. So what I'm trying to do is Let's see which kind of interesting physics, which kind of interesting physics can we actually study with this system? Okay, can we see effects of photon-photon interactions here, and what should we be looking for? All right. So, all right. So what I'll be dealing with is not a single atom, but I'll try to look at what happens if we actually take a lot of atoms. Okay, so now what we're trying to do is we're trying to see what is the physics going on in this medium. All right, so if you have many atoms, basically what we are doing is we are making a nonlinear medium. All right, so this means that if photons move around in here, they will somehow interact, right? These photons here will move around, pass each other, meet in the same atom, do something, and have an effect on each other. So the question is, <clears throat> I mean, this here will at some point become a strongly interacting photon fluid, right? So you will have a lot of photons, they will interact. And now it's a complicated many body problem. So indeed, this I would call a strong interaction open non equilibrium many body quantum system. So now I try to put as many buzzwords as possible into one sentence. So I think we can describe it as this. This has all the nice features. And um, so you can study a lot of interesting physics if we can actually realize this in the lab. All right. Now I should admit that while it was nice to throw in all the buzzwords from before, what we are doing at the moment is a little bit simpler. We're just trying to see, okay, let's send in the coherent state from here and let's see what comes out at the other end. And mainly we'll be dealing with a few photons. The other is interesting, but it's hard. So I'm starting at one end. All right, so we will see. And for now, in the beginning, most of the talk, I'll just consider chiral interaction. Uh, that makes the theory a lot easier because now photons just move from here to here to here to here to here. That makes it a lot easier to understand than having to take into account that they move back and forth. Okay, but just about these uh, simplification, I will claim that there's still interesting physics to see here. All right. So what's the what actually happens if you look at the scattering? Well, it has more or less been solved. Sort of in recent years, it was this paper by Shen and Feng, which sort of highlighted what happens. Uh, okay, so let's first look at what happens if we send in a single photon. Let's say that beta is one, meaning that I have chiral, meaning that photon can only move to the right. So the only thing that can happen is that I send in a photon and it comes out here. And you can only get a phase and you can sit down and calculate exactly what is this phase. It is given by this transmission coefficient here. If it's off resonant, it just goes true. If you're on resonant, you actually get a sign change of the photons coming true. More interesting is if we now take two photons. Now, when they solved this, they found that there is a particular solution called a bound state. Uh, so if two photons come in and they have this wave function here, that they are separated from each other sort of exponentially. Then this one, this shape here of the wave function is basically unaffected by the scattering. Uh, and then there's these unbound state W, which are just basically like free particle. And when you do the scattering problem, this one here is just completely unaffected and it just get this phase factor on it, right? So depending on the energy, if it's resonant or off resonant, Again, it just gets a, a phase factor as it propagates through. And here, well, the unbound state, you just take the transmission coefficient for a single particle and you move and you multiply it on it. Okay, so that was in principle solved uh, in this paper here. But of course, actually, if you really check the literature, then often a lot of things are also solved in the old Soviet literature. And in fact, this bound state and a lot of discussion of it can also be found in these Soviet papers from the 80s. Uh, but yeah, I'll get back to that a little later. All right. And even these Soviet papers, they generalize it so that there is, you know, this is just a two body bound state. You can find three body, four body, n body bound states completely analytically in these systems. All right. So, how do we use this to describe what goes on in the scattering? 
Well, let's say we send in a coherent state. So we say we expand it on zero, one, and two photons. Vacuum is easy, it just vacuum comes out. One photon, we just multiply the scattering coefficient on n times. Two photon, what we do is we take the wave packet, expand it on bound state and free states, and we then multiply the transmission coefficient to the end. And in this case, we can calculate more or less exactly what comes out. It's still a lot of work often, but we have at least a prescription for calculating what comes out. Yeah, there are also some terms here that are ignoring where photons are lost. We have them too, but they are messy. All right. An alternative description we use for these, uh, you know, depending a little bit on the problem, there are alternative descriptions which are useful. So one thing is we often say that the speed of light is infinite. Then we can eliminate the field and reduce it to a, an atomic Hamiltonian looking like this. It looks like a mess. It's not. What it is saying is if, you know, this atom here can decay, or I can emit a photon from here and absorb it here. That happens with a rate gamma r. Or I can emit a photon from here and absorb it here. That happens with a rate gamma l. And then there are some phase factors. OK, so this is an effective Hamiltonian that we can use to describe this. Uh, if we have, say, a few photons, and even if we have many atoms, the size of the Hilbert space, that's n to the m, where m is the number of photons. So as long as we don't send in more than two or three photons, you know, there are numerical techniques to handle this and we can solve more or less everything. All right. If we want to go for really high number of photons, then Derek Chang helped us a lot and did this simulations with matrix product state and we could still, at least for reasonable M, figure out the things we wanted. So this basically what I'm saying here is that it is, is not an extremely hard problem. It's a, you know, we need to do a lot of work, but still it's a problem which can be solved. So what I'll be talking about is what is the physics that we see coming out of these results when we solve it. All right. So let's try first the very, very simple, the simplest experiment you can do in terms of light transmission. What happens if you have just a cloud of atom weakly coupled to the light and you send light through it? Well, this is the beer lambert Bourgeois law, right? So if you look, it just says that, you know, light is attenuated exponentially depending on the number of atoms. And so the light that comes out goes down exponentially the longer you have to propagate it, okay? So if you look at the years down here, it was first studied in 1729, almost 300 years ago. So this here is rather known physics, you will think. But let's see if we can actually find something interesting. So let's see what actually happens if we take this simple, well-known system and begin to look at what are actually the correlations of the photons coming out. Okay, if you had asked me some years ago, I would have said there was nothing interesting happening. But when we did the calculation, we saw that this was actually interesting. And then we teamed up with the group of Arno Rauschenbeutel and so they tried to do this. They have atoms near waveguide with a copying efficiency of a little less than a percent. Just turned on the laser and looked at what came out. And then they measured G2. Okay, and what they actually see is that first they see photon anti-correlation, then some yeah, stronger anti-correlation than we think coming out. And then later on, they see photons coming out in pairs. So here, no photons are coming out in pairs. Here, photons are coming out in pair. So despite this simplicity of this system study for 300 years, it apparently still has some surprises. There's some nonlinear dynamics going on. So what is happening in this system? Actually, it's easiest to understand in the high n limit. OK, so let's say that we have a lot of atoms coupled to this, uh, this waveguide here. All right. So. Well, this beta parameter is very small. And if we want to have this nonlinear effect of the two photons interacting, we need them to excite the same atom, right? Because this is only where we see the effect. If this one, if one photon excites this and one photon excites that, there's no interaction between them. The interaction is only there if they try to excite the same atom. So this happens with a probability beta squared, which is of course very small, meaning that these effects here will be very, very small. Well, yes, you can, but the point is you can still see small effect if everything else is small. 
All right, so you just need to make sure that everything else is smaller, then you will see the interesting effect. So how do we do this? Okay, suppose that I send in a single photon and I have a lot of atoms. What will happen is that this photon will just be lost. Okay, there's exponential damping. If my N is very high, I have a lot of atoms, none of the single photon will come out. Okay, so this means that they're completely gone. Now let's look at what happens if we send in two photons. Well, actually, most likely they will also just be lost. That's the most likely process. But if they are lost, I don't see anything at my detector. So when do I actually see something at the detector? Well, let's say that these two photons are come in and that they actually try to excite the same atom. What will happen is now you have an interaction. Once you have an interaction between them, this means that they can exchange energy. So once they change energy, uh, one of them becomes blue detuned, the other one becomes red detuned because they need to conserve the total energy. But now once this photon here is blue detuned, it means that it absorbs less. And this one here is red detuned, so it is no longer on resonance with these atoms, so it's absorbed less. So this means that now they actually have a sizable uh, transmission. So this means that there will be a high probability that they will actually come out at the end. Right? So this means that if I do this, I will have many more pairs coming out. Right? I will be completely dominated by the pairs, and this is why they actually in the experiment see a large G2. Right? So here they see a G2 of five. If I have even more atom, this peak here shoots up to the roof, because the only way that these photons can come out is if they are together as pairs. All right. What happens if we now instead look at the other limit and have very few atoms? Well, what we see is uh, the opposite effect, a dip in the correlation. So how do we understand that? Well, okay, well, let's look at the two photon wave function. So we make two photons at time t and t prime. And now we do the scattering calculation. So we do the scattering physics on this. Okay, so there'll be a constant. This is just the incoming wave. There'll be this linear term, just give laws that doesn't change G2. But let's look at this interesting thing here, the one quadratic in beta R, which is where I absorb and scatter both photons. All right, let's say that these two photons come very, very far from each other in time. Right, so then what will happen is one will be absorbed, re-emitted. The next one will be absorbed, re-emitted. So each time I have an absorption and re-emission, I get a phase of minus one. So I have minus one squared. So this one here will have something with the same phase as what I started with. What happens if I have two photons which arrive essentially at the same time? Well, I can only excite this atom once. The other one will not be excited. So, and then it's re-emitted, I get two photons out. So I'll get a factor of minus one, not minus one squared, but only minus one because I can only excite it once. So my wave function, now it was a constant. Now I get a negative contribution. I have destructive interference. This point here begins to dip. I square it and I get this. All right, so now because of this destructive interference in the forward direction, I actually begin to see anti-correlations instead. All right, now what happens if I now go at a little bit higher in, now have this process happening several times? Well, there's a nice effect going on, which is collective enhancement, right? The scattering gets a factor of n, right? This negative contribution can happen here, 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 and here. So this means that this destructively interfering part actually gets multiplied by n. So as I have more, what will happen is that this dip here gets deeper. Right. And this is what we see in the experiment. So as we have more, we see a deeper and deeper dip. Okay, so what happens if I add more? Okay, let me just say that this is actually interesting. Um, because now we have a collective enhancement of this photon-photon interaction. Right? It can happen here, 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 and here. So all of these different amplitudes actually add up in phase and give a collective enhancement. So the fact that it can happen several places enhances the effect. Um, now, of course, people are used to seeing 
a collective enhancement in atomic ensemble. This has been exploited in particular by my, gene, my colleague, Eugene Polsic. They see a lot of experiments where they do quantum effect and they have collective enhancement. But what is happening in those experiments is always that uh, they have a strong field and then they do quantum fluctuations on top of it. Here, it is actually a different kind of collective enhancement. I have weak effects. I really have individual photons. I have one photon and one photon and they it's their interaction that is enhanced. So this is actually, if you solve in the language of quantum information, means that it is a non-Gaussian operation which is uh, enhanced by this collective enha enhancement. And this gives you some new opportunities. You can begin to do operations that you couldn't do with the other type of collective enhancement. So one thing in particular that comes out is that if I just pick the right N, the right number of atoms for my light to go through, this one here just keeps dipping, dipping, dipping. At some point, it should hit zero. So if I now have a source with G2 equals zero, that could actually be a single photon source. So you could actually, by just having these weakly coupled atoms, you could turn this into a single photon source. Why would that be interesting? Suppose you want to do a single photon source at a frequency where you cannot couple atoms strongly. You can also make a strong, a pretty good single photon source if you're going to have a strong coupling of atoms to a waveguide. You just excite the atom and it emits, and out comes a single photon. Now, if I do it this way, actually what I'm using is I'm using this large number of atoms, M, to compensate for my uh, bad coupling. So I can actually make a single photon source in this way instead with weakly coupled atom. So suppose that I have no idea why anybody would want it, but suppose you wanted to make a single photon source at x-rays. It will probably be hard to get this high beta, but what this does here is I give you a technique to do it with a low beta, with weakly coupled atoms. So if you want to do it, it could actually be a potential way to have x-ray, single photons for x-rays, if you have some applications of that. All right. Right, so this is uh, some fun we had in this very, very simple uh, system, lambert Beer's law. Uh, but what I actually want to talk about most of the time, the rest of the time, is something a little bit more exotic, is that we are trying to make or look at what photon bound states are. Okay, What are they? What are the properties? How do they behave? There are these bound states, and we want to figure out what are they. And so for simplicity, I will for now neglect all imperfections and just assume perfect chiral interaction beta right is one. Okay, so no imperfections for now, just trying to see which kind of physics is there in this system. All right, so I told you before that there are these special bound state solution when you solve the scattering problem here with just a two level system. There is this uh, special solution which sort of survives this one here. It just gets this phase factor here once you solve the scattering problem. And so in this paper here, they called it the bound state. Okay. I don't know what you think about this, but when I first read this, my reaction was, I don't believe this. I was really, you know, no way. I mean, this is not a bound state. Come on, this is a scattering. This is, okay. That was my first reaction. Um, so, you know, I was not at all convinced. Okay. I actually now I believe they are right. Okay, I do agree with them, but it took me some while. So basically what I wanted to understand was what, when I first started working on this, what does this term bound state actually means? All right. So why didn't I like it? I mean, my issue with this is that the bound state is not a property of, of you know, point scattering. Bound state is I have some medium, I have two particles, they bind together, they fly around like this, right? So, you know, that's a bound state, not just, you know, that's a bound state. What is that? Okay, so I was upset and didn't like it, so I wanted to understand it. So, the first thing we wanted to look at was what happens actually if you look at this in a medium, right? So, let's make it into a medium. We take not only one, but we take n atoms. And now we want to see if we can understand this bound state. So what is it? Okay, we send these in and we want to understand the physics. So what do we do? 
Well, of course, this is back to elementary quantum mechanics. So you have a two particle problem. So you take a mega wave function ansatz. So you say that there's a center of mass coordinate which has some momentum, and then there's a wave function of the relative coordinates. We solve this sort of in the atomic model where we say that excitation can be in this atom and this atom here, okay? So this was our ansatz, and then we try to solve what we do is you, look at the Schrodinger equation, turn it into a equation for the uh, relative wave function in the difference. And then indeed, when we solve this, we find two types of solutions. One of them is free, where there's like e to the i k prime and then just the difference between the two. So that's like a free particle just moving through. And then indeed, we find this bound state solution here, which is just now e to the minus gamma, the distance and then over the group velocity. So indeed, okay, this is what convinced me that there is actually a bound state. So when I go to this medium here, they are really, when I formulated in terms of this relative wave function, it really makes sense to talk about a localized state like that. And I was very, very happy, uh, you know, oh, we have proven that we look, we can make a medium description and, you know, everything is nice and beautiful and this bound state is just in a medium. And I told Sahan even twice that we should write a paper about this, but each time he came back and said, well, you know, you should remember to check your old Soviet literature. These two papers here, this isn't exactly, in fact, exactly how they solved it back in the 80s. So, so, so they already gave my medium theory that they, okay, here's a medium, what are the bound states? All right. So, so, okay, I was now convinced, but now depressed, depressed that my result was apparently useless because it was known. So what instead we began to look at is, okay, now it seems that these bound state are actually real. I believe them at least. So how can we actually design an experiment where we really see that, you know, these bound states are there and they're real. All right. So the first thing one should realize is that what you would naively do to look for a bound state is you look for G2, right? Because once you have G, once you have a bound state, you would expect two photons to come out at the same time. And that the obvious way to see that is in G2. Now, this is actually not in itself enough, right? Because let's me now go back to this experiment we did for the small beta. Okay, and let me look at what happens to the relative wave function of the two photons. Okay, we start by sending in an uncorrelated state. It is flat and there's no dependence on the difference in time. Okay, let me now try to describe this in terms of bound state and unbound state. So I take this wave function here, I expand it on the bound state and on the unbound state and then the unbound contribution, of course, these two has to add up to this. So since the bound state is this localized state, the unbound must look like that. Okay, now I can do the scattering. Well, what happens if you are on resonance, the bound state just dies very quickly if beta is small. It just dies, it goes away. This one here also get damned and deformed, but because this one has contributions which are off resonance, it actually survives much longer than the bound state. So in the end, what you have is you have this contribution here, meaning that your total wave function is just the unbound and look like this. When I square this, we get exactly this result that we see for high number of atoms, all right? So in this experiment here, we actually see two photons coming out at the same time, but there's absolutely no bound state in it. Okay, so we cannot just rely on seeing G2 and G2 is big, that's not the same as seeing the bound state. So what we wanted to do is actually try to see some useful signature. So let's look at the properties of these bound states. How do they behave? Well, you know, let's see if I send in one photon. Okay, what happens again, I talked about it earlier. I get a delay, you do the math. If you're on resonance, this delay is actually four or gamma. Okay, let me now try to send in two photons. What happens is one get absorbed, the other one comes by, picks up this one photon by stimulated emission and they come out, both of them simultaneously, All right? So let me now assume that I not only do this for two, but I do it for M photons. What will happen? Well, 
the one atom can only absorb one photon. So there's only one out of n photons which actually get delayed. And then actually the delay that this one suffers goes down by one over m because there are m photons which can make stimulated emission. So this means that in total, the average delay of such an m photon bound state should go as one over m squared. All right. And this is actually also exactly what we find once we do make look at the dispersion relation for uh, a photon by pair, or you know, for a bound state of n photons. What we find is that indeed it propagates through this medium, and the delay it gets per atom is four divided by gamma divided by m squared. So the more photons, the faster it moves, simply because one atom cannot you know, slow them all down and there's this stimulated emission, which means that the delay goes as one over n squared. The more photons that are bound, the faster they move. All right, so that's sort of the essential physics that we are now doing, which sort of says, okay, how we want to distinguish it. So what we considered was, let's take all of these atoms here, send in a coherent pulse and look at what comes out. And so here we have sent it past 20 atoms. Okay, so now we should look at this. This is the blue curve here. That's the total transmission of what is coming out. So there's like peaks, there's some peaks here, there's a peak here and there's a peak here, all right? So this one here delayed by 80, that is four times 20 divided by gamma. So this one here is delayed by 80, right? So that's the single photon. That's individual photon, they move at this velocity. What happens if I now have two? Well, I take the 80 and I divide it by two squared, they should come out at 20. And indeed, if I look at now G2, G2 is zero here because photon, this is a single photon. But at this peak here coming out, I actually see a strong G2 signal because now all the photons come out in pairs. And I can go on 80 divided by nine is somewhere around here. Here I have three photons coming out, right? And now I actually, there's also a green curve here, which is G3 with peaks here, right? So what this really shows you is that you have really this separation that the bound state behaves significantly different from the free particles. The free particles move at this velocity, the bound state moves at this one. And we can go on. So this is where we needed some fancy matrix product state to simulate it. Uh, so this is past 60 atoms. So now one atom is peak is over here. There's a two atom, there's a three atom, four atom, five atom, six atom peak. And indeed here the, the G2 begins to peak here. G3 begins to peak, it's not part of G4 is here and G6 is here. Okay, so I can really see that if I just send in this or stream of photon, I can have the output be sort of located into different beams depending on which kind of bound state I have. Okay, so to me, this is uh, really actually a signature that these bound state, it makes sense to talk about them, right? They really behave differently when they're bound than when they're not bound. All right. Now, of course, when I showed this to my experimental colleagues, they begin to scream at me because 20 atoms, 60 atoms, they don't like it. Um, so of course, if you want to see something really cool and convincing, the more the better. But you can actually already begin to see these effects if you have a few uh, emitters. So here is now a calculation of what happens if we just send a pulse to one, two or three atoms. And now this is where is the sort of, what is the probability density of where do we detect the photon? Okay, so if it was uncorrelated photon, we would just expect a little blob here. But of course, we see there's some interferences going on. That is not what I want to see, talk about. But if I look here on this diagonal here, what we see is that um, this is where the photons come at the same time. And this part here actually extends a little bit further than it does in this direction. So this is already with a single atom. We can see slight change signatures of actually this photon bound state moving faster. Uh, it becomes much more pronounced if I have two atoms. Now you can really see that the uh, photons move together, move faster if they come together. So this here is really a signature of the bound state moving faster just past two emitters. And 
even more pronounced if it's treated. So you can actually begin to see these effects here. Um, even for a reasonably small uh, number of atoms, even just having two chirally coupled atoms, you should be able to have some reasonable convincing uh, signatures that really see the different physics of the bound state. All right, but since these uh, bound state apparently makes sense, let's try to do something else to it. So let's say that we were CERN and we discovered a particle. Oh, they would say it's fun. Let's try to smash it into something together and see how it behaves once we smash it together. Uh, okay, so let's do that. So here's another little fun calculation we did. So now we take a bound state and we take a free photons and we sort of just send them through this medium. And what happens is that the bound state moves faster. So at some point they will collide and now we can make a collision experiment with our new pet, this uh, photon bound state. So let's see what our simulation says. Okay, this is, um, it's a little bit hard to understand this. It is the density of photons in a co-moving frame. So think about this as position and time, right? So as time progresses, this one here, in a co-moving frame, there's a little delay for the photon pair because it moves fast, whereas the single photon gets a lot of delay meaning it moves fast in the co-moving frame with the speed of light. All right, so let's see that these photons here just travel at their own velocity. Then you would expect that this here to just be a straight line. But what you actually see is that now as these here move and this photon pair overtakes this, this one here actually gets a little bit delayed because these two things are attracted. Uh, similar, you see it also in the other one. This one, bound state, get attracted to the single photon. Uh, this is, of course, heavier, so it has less, uh, you know, less uh, deflection, but it's still there. And so at this point here, you actually see a collision. And what is actually cool also to see here is that, you know, these bound state are apparently somewhat stable. Uh, because, you know, I have them here and I throw something at it and, well, at least what I threw at them in this experiment didn't kill it, right? It still survives. These two photons still travel together. So it's actually somewhat stable, this bound state here, even to external perturbations. All right, it is stable and now I can begin to like, okay, here's my molecule of photons. Here's my atom. How do they interact? So in principle, I can begin to study the physics of this. All right, so this is now, I mean, to me, this makes sense to talk about these single photon as, you know, something, uh, you know, so these bound state as, as something really a physical entity that is different from single photons. But now, what are they actually? Um, well, let's try to sort of see the classical. I said that they exist for any number of photons, I can make very large bound state. Uh, so let me now try and take sort of a simpler weak coupling limit where I now take a very big detuning, meaning that the effects, all the effects are small and I have many, uh, many photons. This is sort of the limit where mean field theory makes sense. Okay, so let me now go very far detuned and try to make a mean field description. Okay. So the Hamiltonian of atoms interacting with, uh, sort of photons interacting with some interacting like this, this you can describe by sort of one over D tuning, and then there's the density of atom, and then there's A dagger A, the number of photons. So of course the photon can excite you there, it sort of shift their energy down. Okay, now, right, so I can, but what can happen is that once I have many photons, I try to excite, and as I excite, 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 there will at some point be fewer atoms down here. So this means that this row here, the density of atom will go down. All right, so that's just the care effect. All right, it is there also in this case. Right. So now what I can do is I can say the density of atoms goes down as one minus and then something proportional to the number of photons that I have. All right. So if I take this and sort of in mean field theory, like plug it in here, I will actually have an effective attraction. It's like there's a potential for the photons, which is proportional to the density. And now I can make a mean field theory and I can solve it. In fact, people have done that calculation a lot and several times, and it's used a lot. This is called solitons. 
you have a, like a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, you look for eigenstates of that, they are known as soliton. They are, for instance, used in optical communication. So this talk here is probably right now being transmitted through soliton. You can find stable solution where the electric field goes as the hyperbolic seconds times, you know, the gamma times T. And then you need to divide by the number of photons because the more photons you have, the more attracted together, uh, the more attraction you have and you sort of have the stable solution here sort of very well localized. Okay, so that is just the electric field of a solid something to find in mean field theory. What happens if we now take an m photon bound state, let m be very big and we calculate the electric field, we get exactly the same. Right. So in this case, the electric field is again this hyperbolic seconds gamma t and then divided by the number of photons in the bound state. The electric field is exactly the same as the solid. So basically here in this limit here, there's absolutely no difference between the soliton and the bound state. Right. Now what if resonant? It is actually a little bit more complicated, but there's also sort of known in the classical literature. Let's try to calculate the Rabi frequency. We get that by just taking the square root of gamma times E. And let's integrate the Rabi frequency in the bound state from zero to infinity. What we get is two pi, exactly two pi. Okay, again, this is what this means is that, okay, we excite each atom up and it goes down. So each atom experience a two pi pulse. It goes up, it goes down, return to the ground state exactly. Okay, this no, uh, this uh, solution here is actually known as self-induced transparency uh, because what you do, you go up and you go down, meaning that no photons are lost from your pulse, right? Because you return, you excite, and you return the uh, atom to the ground state exactly. So this is well known that this can sort of give you very much enhanced transmission through media where you could normally not get any transmission simply because you do pi poles and exactly return the atom to the ground state so you have no losses. Again, this is sort of a soliton, uh, their well-known stable solution of the mean field equation. And yeah, this is exactly the same as what we get by our bound state. And so what comes out of this one here is that these photon bound state, they are nothing but sort of the a uh, quantum version of solitons, right? So take a soliton, they are normally done with thousands of photons. Now reduce the number of photons and you end up with these photon bound state. They're exactly the same. All right, uh, so how are we doing on time? Do I have a little bit more time? Uh, yeah, maybe like five minutes or something. Would that yeah, be- I'm to, I wanted to include some recent result that, I mean, some plots which are also uh, yeah, then we... yesterday. <laughs> Okay, I mean, there should also be time for a discussion, but yeah, I mean, go, go for okay, it. Okay, let me try to rush through it. So basically, uh, okay, I'll not go into as much detail. So everything so far was for the chiral system. We recently managed to also solve the non chiral system. And let's just take the completely non chiral and perfect limit. Uh, the reason why we're interested in this is that chiral so far only exist in the optical regime. But if you look at the experiment, they work much better in the microwave frequency. There you don't have chiral. Uh, there are proposals for how to do it, but nobody has done it. So, but if you really want to see these effects, it would be much easier if you could do it with non-chiral system, because then you can do it with superconducting qubits. All right. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated because now your photons can bounce back and forth. Um, so now it really is a medium effect because the bound state begins to depend on something like the distance. It makes it a little bit more complicated, uh, but actually, you know, you lose block theorem and you can actually still solve it. Okay, so what we do is first we solve the single particle solution. So you get a dispersion relation for single particles in this. Okay, so if there were three photons, you would just have them here moving with the speed of light, which is like infinite. Uh, compared to everything else. But once you solve it, you have single particle, single photon dispersion relation here. All right. Uh, we solved it for two, never mind how we did it. 
So let's look at what comes out. So let's say that we take two photon and say that we have give them uh, k momentum k per photon. So now we can make states where we now take two from here. And so we can take one here and one here that would give something with zero. Or we could take one here and one here with zero. So looking at what are the possible states of single photon, and if we then just neglect the interactions, then we can ask ourselves what are the possible states that we can get out for two photons as a function of momentum. So this is what we get here. Uh, so I can take, if I take blue, that corresponds to taking two from this branch, orange, two from that branch, green, one from that branch, one from that branch. Okay. So when we look at these spectrum of allowed state, there's like a forbidden region where you would think that you couldn't have any solution. And then there's actually also a state where, uh, where you know, a point where the density of state goes to zero. Now, just look, look at what happens if we now solve this uh, two-body problem. Okay, so now what begins to be is we have states which fill this region here, and we have some special state sort of in this continuum. Turn on the interaction. Okay, if I look at how the solutions look here, they oscillate a little bit per down, but then die out just like a bound state should. And so indeed, these are stable bound state because there are no single particle states that they can decay into. Right here at this point here, we actually also find a very nice bound state. It just goes down exponentially. But then if we look here in the continuum, we have states which look like bound state, and then there is some oscillating continuum state. Right. So what these things are is this here is a bound state. This here is basically a scattering resonance. So now these photons in this system here, we, they have this momentum here. We have these states where they actually come in and hang around, move around across each other and near each other for a while and then separate again. So we can find scattering resonances. And then finally, we have this one here. This is basically the same scattering resonance as this, but now the decay rate just goes to zero because the density of state goes to zero. Okay, so there's some kind of new phenomena uh, going on here. All right, so let me now wrap up. Uh, so what I've tried to convince you is that this system here, even though it's simple, it can actually be a rather rich many body system. We can see effects even for weakly coupled atom, which was a big surprise to us. Uh, and it can maybe even be applied to these single photon sources. Um, there are also these bound state solutions. They are like quantum limit of the classical solitons. Just take very few photons and you know we find them. They are, I would say, really genuine physical entities, right? They behave differently. You know, they move at a different speed. They have different dispersion relation. When I kick them, they remain bound and so on. So I think it really makes sense to talk about them as a specific physical entity, just like molecules. Um, in principle, we only need two emitters. So if two, somebody can give me two good chirally coupled emitters, it should be possible to see this effect of the bound state behaving differently. Um, we can also see them with, uh, with non chiral emitters. Uh, it's a little bit more complex because now they're new phenomena. We have these scattering resonances. We don't know how to see that. We are working on that. So, yeah, that's one of the things we would like to do. So, because now these two uh, systems are there and they work very well. So, can we design an experiment where we can really conclusively see, okay, these bound states behave differently? And um, in principle, I think we could also make them in 3D. Um, in my, if you could make it in 3D, I don't know, arrange atom in optical lattices, I think you could actually also make these bound state. The reason why I believe that is that, again, they are the quantum limit of solitons. And 3D solitons, where light really is localized in space, is known uh, to exist sort of in mean field theory in the classical limit. So it should also be possible at two photon. So these are the they are actually known as photon bullets. So of course, once you have photon bullets, it's only a small step. Can we scale this into photon torpedoes? Here's the Star Trek preference I promised. And yeah, but of course the big thing we want to do at some point is we will try to see really what is the many body dynamics. So far we have had so much, we have been so busy looking at few body dynamics that we haven't had time to look at the many body dynamics. And okay, let me finally thank the people again who did this work. Thank you.
Oh, thank you. Thank you for this exciting talk somehow between science fiction and very real experiments. Um, the, the floor is open for questions. So are there any there? Well, let me maybe start with the question. I think like people should just like unmute themselves and then start talking. Um, so like in this in this last part, um, can I just understand this as like some sort of parametric scattering where I have a like a band structure and then like you kind of like you create a pair of photons and then you scatter and you just like you you get all the combinations where you conserve energy and momentum. Is that like a could that be in a, a simpler way of understanding um, uh, on this part here? Yep. Um, I mean. You need to conserve energy and momentum, yeah. right? So that's clear. So now, if I find a solution here, is it stable? Well, there's nothing it could decay into, right? Because there's no at this momentum and this energy here. There's simple, simply no solutions where the photons are far apart from each other. Yeah. If okay. you take non-interacting photons, they cannot have that energy and that momentum. So if I find a state there, it must be bound because it cannot decay. Uh, if I find a state here, now that can actually decay into unbound state. So of course, at some point it will. And indeed, this is what we see. You know, it lives there for, for a while and then it decays. Right, yeah. That makes sense. Other questions? I think we maybe overstrained time a bit, but um, sorry about I that. Actually, <laughs> sorry, I mean, like normally there are no constraints, but people probably have to leave. Um, so I, I wondered about this in in the middle. You you showed like the the results like for one, two, and three emitters, uh, and it really looked like one and two, uh, one and three, like kind of looked similar, and then two was different. So, yeah. So, can you so explain why this, why that is? It's the main effect is that you have this change of phase. Uh, you know, so if whether if you if they, you if they are on the same time, you get a phase shift of pi. If you are different times, you get a phase shift of two pi. So this is why you see this interference here, where you go from pi to two pi. You change the sign, and you have to go to zero. Here, when you do it, when you do scattering two times, right? So there's basically destructive interference here. When you do it two times, you change the phase twice. So now you have plus everywhere. So now you have constructive interference. Now you change the phase once again. You have destructive interference. So I would say that it's like an interference effect between the bound and the unbound uh, contribution that is either constructively or destructively interference. So you should like think about it. There's a blob here, and there's sort of a narrow here, and you have the interference with the, between it, and that can either be positive or negative. So that continues then. Probably also like to higher n. Yes. Uh, so the solar group did it for the perfectly chiral, and then you could see that this was sort of completely periodic. Uh, what happens that two atoms was the same as doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, last last chance for a, for a question. Okay, sorry for talking too long. It seems that I've scared people away, but <laughs> they've had enough of me. No, I'm sure there there were time constraints. I mean, this was a very nice nice talk, very interesting. So thanks again for coming around or virtually coming around for taking the time. Yes. Um, next week, sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, so next week we'll have Jacopo Carasoto talking um, and um, yeah, everyone is welcome to, to join that talk too.